What's up, sad boys? How are we doing today? Kind of a bummer episode. Sorry. I have recently been talking about sitcoms. My viewing of the iCarly reboot on Paramount Plus, which failed to live up to what I would consider to be the pinnacle golden standard of all situational comedies, and that is the production that created Frasier, which made its broadcast debut September 16th, 1993. I'm talking about the Kelsey Grammer-led Seattle set show about our favorite radio talk show psychologist and the wacky adventures and situations in which he gets up to. Frazier has had such a grand impact on my life that my first tattoo is the Seattle skyline done in the style of the Frasier stencil. And while I would love to do a Jose style video going through a comprehensive breakdown of the series as a whole, I, however, have more pressing thoughts, specifically about one episode with subject matter and themings that I was not prepared to receive, that I did not know was coming. I'm talking about the episode where Frasier apologizes to his childhood rapist. <laughs> This is where I must issue a content warning for this episode in question discusses but does not depict statutory rape. While the writers themselves take it extremely lightheartedly, I will be handling the subject with the severity that I believe it deserves. But that doesn't mean that I won't also make jokes. So if this perchance makes you uncomfortable, then I will not be offended if you click off as long as you click on a different video of mine where I'm not talking about this. For those who are staying, welcome. Let's talk about Frasier. We were friends. More than friends, actually. You really don't remember. I'm trying. You must have some recollection of a fair-haired boy outside your door, at the piano, on the piano. I should tell you that we, we had a romance that uh, didn't have the happiest of endings. Now, I grew up in the 90s. I know, fucking gag. But that also means I grew up watching Kelsey Grammer as the radio psychologist in my home city of Seattle, Washington. Frazier, Charles, Crane had previously made his debut on the NBC staple Cheers, which came to an end four months prior to Frasier's premiere. Now, I've never seen a single episode of Cheers, but what I can gather is there was once a place where everyone knew your name. It was a classic live audience sitcom that centered around a bar and its patrons. It lasted 11 years and produced 275 episodes. One such recurring character would be psychiatrist Frazier Crane, who first appeared in season three of Cheers. While he would have substantial character growth on the show, one time being wed to the series lead herself, he would eventually leave all that behind to become Seattle's leading radio personality. Frazier finds our lead recently divorced from his wife Lilith, who he had married and fathered a child with during his time on Cheers. Now, living on the opposite coast, Frazier enjoys the finer things of life. Chair by Eames, and this couch is an exact replica of the one Coco Chanel had in her Paris atelier. A lifestyle that is flipped upside down when his retired cop dad, a cab moves in along with his British caretaker, Daphne, which I just want to take a second to admire just the sheer fucking fashion icon that Daphne is in these first seasons. You were a policeman, weren't you? Yeah, how'd you know? I must confess, I'm a bit psychic. Today, the subject is about the season two premiere entitled Slow Tango in South Seattle. 
The episode opens like many of the previous 22 episodes with Frasier at the station with his producer Roz. He is in the midst of a discussion with a caller while Roz is unusually distracted by a novel. Slow tango in South Seattle. Oh god, not you too. Why is it that every woman I see is carrying that book around? A hot new erotica romance novel. Frasier already annoyed with it. It's like when there's a new pop song that everyone is digging and you just see it everywhere to the point where it feels inescapable. So by the time you interact with the art, the uh, the water is soiled. The, so the soil is soiled. The, wa the water soils the, the soil. It is when Frazier inspects the book that he finds the author is familiar to him. You used to drink with Thomas J. Fallow? Well, actually, I spent most of my time helping him get through his writer's block. And while Frasier here does mention that they met at a bar in the series Cheers, Thomas J. Fallow actually never showed up as a character in that series itself. What, do you know him? Yes, yes, he used to drop into a neighborhood bar I frequented back in Boston. It's a bit pretentious, though. He stuck out like a sore thumb. <laughs> During this hypothetical episode, Frasier helped Thomas J. Follow through his writer's block. And Thomas himself is scheduled to make an appearance at the radio station the following day. He's coming here to the station tomorrow to be on Amber Edwards' book chat, and you're going to introduce oh, us. No, no, no. And the book person on the state. You know, every radio station has, like, a book person. A psychiatrist, a sports guy, a food critic. It's what every radio station needs to give you a well-rounded flow of content. Frasier... The show is a half-hour comedy that is designed and structured like almost all half-hour comedy. There's a cold open that introduces the theme or the problem of the episode before we fade out into our first set of commercials. Ready in five. I'm Carly. Four. They do something creatively different with Frasier in that it draws attention to this mostly common structuring by welcoming the audience back with a title card in what I believe is meant to be kind of an ode to the opera. Like, it's to set the mood. It's a quotation or a phrasing, something to just get you an idea for the next act. In episode 201, after the first ad break, Victory. the title we are greeted with states, a phrase that could have many different meanings, many different contexts, but one that does make you at least perk up and say, Great Eagle! We then cut to Frazier's apartment, a beautiful open set with a gorgeous backdrop of the Seattle Space Needle. One of the most striking sets compared to, I don't know, the living room of this family, or uh, the living room to that one. We're introduced to Frazier's father, the fucking pig. Daphne is trying to exercise his leg. Eddie, his trusty little Jack Terrier, just a golden boy of a pup. My name is Matilda Cagney, and I'm the uh, trainer of uh, Moose here, who plays Eddie on Fraser. Moose here is a uh, now 12 years old Jack Russell Terrier. You had some stellar working dogs in Hollywood at the time, but the work that Moose, what he provides on Fraser is legendary. Some dogs play a little too much for the camera. Yes, I'm looking at you, Comet from Full House. You can't just be a mugging whore in every goddamn scene. Eddie the dog knew just when to turn it up and just when to blend in with the scene, when to be an accessory for the characters, and when to be the subject itself. Daphne stops the exercising to answer the door, which she finds Niles. He is a series regular, and this is not uncommon for him to just stop by unannounced, you know, like how siblings do, just always showing up at the house. At least he knocks. What is odd, though, is Daphne jokingly threatening that if someone doesn't let us get on with them, he's gonna get a little spank on his fanny. On his fanny? Which Americans know is a word for uh, your butt. However, the British actually use it as a term for vagina. So given that Daphne is 
British. Maybe she didn't have any input when the writers were uh, telling her how to be British. I'm originally from Manchester, England. Oh, really? Did you hear that, dear? I'm three feet away. There's nothing wrong with my hair. Before we can ponder the existential questions of love and acceptance by a parent that doesn't necessarily get or like anything about you. The other day, I couldn't help but notice that you had pictures of Fraser and Frederick and an autographed one from someone named Ken Griffey Jr., but none of Maris and me. So I brought you this. Oh, gee, thanks. Frazier comes storming me into the room with a copy of Slow Tango in hand. It appears that when Frazier helped Thomas out of his little writer's block so many years ago, he had confessed his life story, his darkest secrets kept by him. It is here when Daphne confesses that she has been avidly reading the novel, and where she spoils that very single novel. It's about his first time. This peaks up Martin and Niall's curiosity. Who is this charitable lass? Charitable lass. That is not important. It's piano teacher. I mean, it's all right there in black and white about your awkward teenage lunging and how you used to call your chest hair your rug of love. Daphne gleefully reveals that it was the piano teacher. The piano teacher? Oh, Martin confirms. <laughs> Boy, this really fries me. You know, that woman taking advantage of my kid? Not to mention I was putting out 10 bucks a week for piano lessons so you could get your heads trimmed. Just a smidge of reality, just a little easy beansy touch of self-awareness before we gank it out from the audience. Here we have some really telling language. I'm taking advantage of my kid. Being taken advantage of. This rules out any plausible deniability on the part of the writers. They just didn't really think about it that hard. They just didn't know the implications of the story they were telling. They acknowledge in the text the power dynamic in that type of relationship, but choose instead to make a joke on how Martin was paying for Fraser to get his hedge trimmed. Was his piano teacher trimming his pubes? What the f is that joke supposed to mean? Concerns are quickly raised though when Niles is questioned if she also took advantage of him. Be relieved to know that while Fraser was getting his rock money off, I was actually studying music. <laughs> this is quickly dispersed, however, with a joke before Fraser says the most confusing thing I've ever heard. This was not some tawdry older woman lusting after young flesh. Clarice and I cared for each other. She showed me a, a world I'd never known. That's interesting that the first person to defend his abuse is Fraser himself. He didn't feel anything wrong with the situation at the time. As Mr. Fallow put it, she saw your sensitive poetic side. And you couldn't help noticing the way her ripe, heaving bosom would brush your cheek when she reached for the metronome. Even adds in with this remarkable insight from the book she read and not Fraser's own living memories. So it's more than just a lusting. It is a physical interaction that she is having with this teenage boy. There is a sexuality that is being put on and received by both parties. And by this point in the episode, I hope you can see the issue. Not all of it's true. He did take some literary license. You're not really able to bring a woman to hidden realms of ecstasy with your panther-like prowess. Well, that party got right. <laughs> In 2009, Lisa Levoy pleaded guilty to three accounts of statutory rape and enticing a child after her and a 15-year-old went missing for a week, only to turn up in a motel in West Virginia. She was an elementary school teacher in Massachusetts. The prosecution asked the judge for a sentencing of three to five years. The judge, however, have these following comments. In most cases involving adults having sexual relationships with children, it is an adult male, and the motivation is more likely to be sexual gratification. Based on... But I find this is not the case. In fact, it's quite the contrary. The voice, interest, and concern for the boy's emotional well-being. Ah, well, if the intentions are well, we mean well. It appears Lavoie's kindness towards the boy is what led his sexual interest in her. Sorry, my bad. It's her fault for being nice to a student. Wait, it is her fault. Wait, hold on. It is her fault. We just admitted it. Why didn't she get uh, punished for it?
There are those who perhaps will say this sentence is too lenient. This too shall pass. I don't find this young lady to be a sexual predator. Why are our social structures set in such a way that we believe a woman cannot rape a, a man? Are we scared to admit that it is possible for a woman to abuse sexual power over male counterparts? For it could shatter the entire facade of masculinity and gender roles that the weakest man must at least be stronger than the strongest woman or else what does anything mean? Because people think there is some sort of link between a cock and violence. Like the penis is nothing but a fleshy knife with the sole purpose of finding a victim to penetrate. But a vagina, that must be something pure and holy that is treated with the utmost respect. So we are left with a question. Is the show's approach to handling the subject matter a result of broad cultural ideas being reflected in the media and how can that inform us as people 26 years after the airing of this episode? I fear we may have to venture further into this episode to find out. Back at the radio station, Frazier confronts Roz. Waiting outside of the booth, Frazier is all revved up and ready to go. Not because his most traumatic secret has been exposed, or God forbid, hindsight 2020 and a f***ing psychiatrist would be able to recognize that it was inappropriate for an instructor to have a relationship with the f***ing child, but rather, he is upset that his co-workers will think it is embarrassing. You haven't told anyone about this, have you? They'd have a field day with me. Frazier, give me credit for a little discretion, will ya? A fear that is justified when the station's very own sportcaster scumbag Bulldog comes in saying, Hey, piano boy. Frazier and Bulldog are somewhat adversarial. They occupy the same workplace and the same airwaves, and yet live on opposite sides of the social spectrum. Bulldog, however, lends out an unintentional olive branch. I had a similar experience when I was 16. Of course, she was a hooker. It was a birthday present for my dad, okay? You wanna know the ironic thing, Doc? All I wanted was a bike. Bulldog has proven in the show to be angry, violent-prone individual with a short temper and it is always play for laughs. For him to ask for a bike and to be presented with a sets worker. Also, this sort of speaks towards the very real-world stats that one out of 33 men will experience attempts of sexual assault. And one out of 10 sexual assaults are towards men themselves. All incredibly horrendous things that we all live with but never really speak about. Trivializing it for cheap laughs. All I wanted was a bike. <laughs> And yes, you're looking at me, you're screaming, it's a fucking sitcom show from 1994. How deep do you expect them to get? I call him Eddie Spaghetti. Oh, he likes pasta. No, he has worms. <laughs> and yes, I completely agree. This is a fun and light show that rarely dwells into the deeper topics, but I believe that sitcoms are great for the message episode. To have the characters go through something real after making it out episode after episode, season after season, can really just hit in a place. Like the police episode of Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Or any breakup episode of that 70s show. The upsetting part comes with the questions that are being raised. The writers acknowledge that there was advantage taken, and then we just ignore all that and actually present the message that reinforces stereotypes. Fraser Crane's double decker. It consists of aged pheasant, spring chicken, and of course plenty of tongue. <laughs> And as the dirty little leftist feminist that I am, I care about men, and I don't want them to be raped as children or teenagers. Frazier then gets the opportunity to confront Thomas himself, only to have Thomas break down crying in Frazier's arms. Frazier made him cry. <laughs> Frazier comes home all frazzled to find Martin and Niles. You don't just let things happen and enjoy it. You gotta analyze everything to death. Niles informs Frazier that Thomas does go on to publicly credit Frazier for the story. 
This, however, does not satisfy Frasier. Like, there is a deep hole of trauma inside of him, and everyone just keeps pretending like it's fine and natural and good for his development, but now he is divorced and on the other side of the country, away from his child. Daphne enters a scene more intensely than Frasier had, with vitriol towards him for running out. Daphne is mad at teenage Frasier for leaving the relationship with his doll piano teacher. Shame on you! You just ran out on her, leaving her bed as empty as a swallow's nest. Just been accepted to Harvard. What else was I gonna do? Daphne is mad that Frasier left the person that groomed him to pursue the highest education. Which, way to go. I just want to really hand it to the three male writers. Daphne, the one female representative voice besides Ross, but Ross has never been a role model. The one female representative voice siding with the woman who abused Frasier. And I'm just gonna guess, the actress didn't really have much say in that choice. Just like, she doesn't even really get to properly express that she's British. I get a little spank on his family. <laughs> the scene in question is described as, You never said goodbye to Miss Warner? Well, she was sleeping so peacefully. <laughs> she had an early lesson! They were so comfortable with one another that they were just used to this situation, to him sleeping over, to them sleeping together. And then Frasier felt the only way that he could possibly leave this relationship was in the middle of the night without notice, to escape to college, and yet the book is told in this part from the perspective of Miss Warner in order to maximize the audience's sympathy for her. Niles puts it like this. Perhaps the person you're really angry at is yourself. You never thanked Miss Warner for the contribution she made to your life. I was only 17 years old. I'm now, Niles and Frazier are psychiatrists, and their advice is given from a professional-lish appearance. I cannot speak to the validity or accuracy of the information. And you kept referring to Jerry with the identity crisis as Jeff. <laughs> Usually their advice is nothing too deep. You rarely see either one of them diagnosing anyone. It just seems weird for a psychiatrist to suggest that the only reason you feel badly about your molestation as a child is because you haven't thanked your molester for what they did to you. I don't know why, but that advice coming from a psychiatrist seems kind of weird. Only 17 years old, I'm sure she understood. She was a vulnerable, lonely, middle-aged woman. It is possible that her feelings for you ran deeper than you realize. That's interesting. That sort of echoes what we heard the judge saying with the Massachusetts teacher. If a woman engages in a relationship with a younger male, it's because they care for them and not because they are looking for any sexual gratification. Later that night, we find Frasier alone reading slow tango in his living room in the dark, reliving old memories. He reads a passage in the perspective of his piano teacher. And in one explosive burst of discovery, he had staked claim to the Pacific Ocean that was my soul, vanishing like a solitary boat on the lonely horizon. Did the writer interview the teacher? This is all interpretation, but somehow we're meant to take it as the very real feelings and thoughts of the teacher herself. And with this, we close out Act 1 and await the confrontation. Decades pass. Will, Will she, she be, be remorseful? remorseful? Will, Will Frasier gain, gain closure? Frasier is at the door of his former instructor and the woman that robbed him of his childhood. He comes face to face with an elderly woman that does not recognize him. I'm Frasier Crane. I'm sorry, my memory is not what it used to be. We are meant to think that this is the Miss Warner from his childhood. And after a couple of awkward moments of Frasier trying to rev up her sexual memory. Fair haired boy outside your door at the piano, on the piano. <laughs> He apologizes sincerely and asks for her forgiveness only for the real Miss Warner to come into the room and reveal that Frasier has actually been talking to her mother. Of course, Miss Warner is younger and much more beautiful. She doesn't look like a rapist at all. And that's the point. What does a rapist look like? A boyfriend, maybe a relative, a best friend, a stranger. 
maybe a pastor, a mentor, a boss, a colleague, maybe even a private f instructor. A criminal cannot be seen. There is not a criminal marking that people are born with, but rather we are marked by the actions that we do onto others. It's only when we create an environment that supports not just men, but all individuals to speak and share and connect with those who feel the same. It's only then are we given the tools to even address the problems. And this can be as simple as social support, online support, anonymous chat room support, or I don't know, maybe funding the mental and emotional health sectors of our healthcare systems. I thought that was what healthcare was for, for caring for the health of the people that you don't want like weird traumatized dicks like running your, your workforce, I guess. I don't know. I'm not an economist. This is what talking does. It creates empathy for those who have suffered, making it easier to deal with your personal struggles. Media has the ability to make you feel alone, angry, and isolated. That's why we should speak up when outdated ideas from almost three decades ago still seep into the very fabric of our world view. It's only through representation that we can even be empowered to ask the questions, to even begin our own self-discoveries. So regardless of how rudimentary the message is, as long as the message is on the right path, this is why I think rainbow capitalism is okay. Yeah, it's disingenuous, it's kinda slime baggy just to sell shit to gay people, but it's better than not seeing it at all. Anyway, I got sidetracked. What's going on with Frasier? No. <laughs> the camera here focuses on the sexual tension, still left unsaid between Frasier and Miss Warner, still scared to act on it, still being pulled in by this person who has influenced him for all these years, the ramifications still lingering around his memory to the point where Frasier finally gets a nerve to ask her out, to ask her for a cup of coffee. The risk of sounding a little forward, would you like to have a cup of coffee with me? Oh, thanks. But I'll have to say no. Looking for any validation he still can get from this woman that took so much from him so long ago. But just in that moment, Warner's boyfriend opens the door, closing any chance of Frasier picking up where his 17 year old self left off. And just like that, she exits the room and Frazier's life, just like he left her alone. Except this time, the mom's there, so we get a little joke, cause the mom, she's all horny now. Now we're alone. <laughs> See what I did? I put a raindrop on my nose. <laughs> this entire episode was building up towards a quick, conversation with remorse only being shown on the behalf of Frasier for how he left her. Warner has no regrets and she barely even gives a second thought to the boy that showed up unannounced on her doorstep and she has nothing for him. Left there alone to play piano, singing us out into the night like he does every episode. And I, as the audience, I feel cold and isolated and alone. Sorry this was such a dour episode. I just wanted to talk about Frasier for once. It didn't go well. Hmm. I watched this thing. It sparked a conversation in my head and I wanted to have that with you. So take that however you want and I will check y'all out on the flip side. Be healthy out there. Men, men, be healthy out there. Hey, baby, I hear you.